Hello, welcome back to irishracing.com where we're going to be previewing day three of the Grand National meeting at Aintree. The Grand National is upon us, the greatest spectacle in steeplechase racing. I mean, it's going to be a fine spectacle indeed. 40 runners going over four miles, some of the toughest fences in the whole sport as well. And joining us on today's show, we have Danny Mullins, who will be riding in the Grand National, we hope, uh, and also has done in the past. Now, Danny, I want to get your view just quickly. I mean, how revered is the Grand National specifically to the jockeys actually riding in it? Yeah, it's unbelievable. You know, it's, I suppose, a different race now. Maybe the fences are not as big as they used to be, but with that, you have a lot more speed. So, you put speed into the equation with 40 horses it's just as exciting as you can get i suppose the funny thing about the the grand national that the i suppose most people don't think about is uh, you have an hour of a break from the race beforehand there's a lot of time for jockeys to think if they're sitting in the way room you're heading out to ride a bad jumper uh, you see a lot of lads getting a little bit white I mean, yeah, sorry, my next question was going to be, I mean, do you remember back your first time running in the Grand National? I mean, how intimidated were you going over that one of those entry fences for the first time? I'd ridden a couple of times in, uh, I think it was second in the top, um, uh, maybe the year before. And yeah, I was really looking forward to it. Uh, my first ride in the National went down. I think I met the first fence in the middle of it and thought I was going to flip and eventually found a leg and then some grey horse from about six wider than me came cannonballing straight underneath me and the next stride turned me over so that was the end of my dream the first go. Uh, I got a better spin uh, the next go around and Acapella Bourgeois was in with a chance going out the second circuit and just flattened out but you know when you get into a rhythm over those entry fences it's every jump jockey stream you know heading down across that melon road looking at six fences in front of you it's fantastic i mean and how much of it does really boil down to a bit of luck like how much luck is involved in that race specifically for you there's plenty of luck you know you, you obviously need a, a class horse but then any second now last year you know it, it was a flip of a coin when that horse fell between Rachel Blackmore and Mark Walsh and unfortunately Mark Walsh was the one who met the traffic and was probably the difference of winning and losing for him you know you, you can't read what's going to happen it's hard enough to find a rhythm on your own horse uh, you just have to have that little bit of luck that you get a clear passage through the race you know you can make yeah uh, what's the, the one of the boxers said yeah you, you have all the the best plans until you get punched in the face <laughs> you just find the rhythm <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, great stuff. We're going to dive into this year's renewal of the Grand National later on in the show. But joining me once again is Vincent Vinnegan, Stephen Harris, and Ed Quigley, along with Danny. Now, we're going to be previewing the grade ones for day three, as well as then, like I say, going in depth into the Grand National. So, the first race I want to talk about is the Betway Mersey Novices Hurdle. So, we are filming this on Wednesday, so we don't have the final declarations yet. Uh, but, Vincent, let's bring you in here as well. How are you seeing this race shaping up? And how does the market look to you? Well, it, look, it looks like there's going to, it's going to be reasonably open. Uh, three Stripe Life is the most likely favourite here. Um, I'd, I'd be surprised if it's not a major contender. The horse has chased home Sir Gerhardt the last twice uh, in Leopardstown and then again in Cheltenham. That, that for me is is really good form, very high class form, three, three Stripe Life. I think the Gordon Elliott horses were under a slight shadow or cloud in Cheltenham, didn't run as well as expected in many of the races. They only had a couple of winners across the week in, in relatively minor races. Um, I, I still think this ran very well, as, as did some of the others to finish place. I think it should win here. Um, another one, if it runs, is Colonel Mustard, um, was third in the Stateman race. Six lengths off um, Three Stripe Life at Leopardstown when it, when it finished third to Sir Gerhardt and Three Stripe Life. Could be a contender at an each-way price. And Stage Star is the other one here. Ran a bit too free in Cheltenham but, uh, and ended up being pulled up. But I would have thought that that might bounce back here if it runs. And Ed, uh, Ed quickly, welcome back to the show. I mean, do you have any pointers here looking at the market as it stands right now? Just very quickly, John, I love the way only a national hunt jockey could uh, describe um, 40 fences at 30 mile an hour as exciting as a, as a few other names I'd probably give it, um, which Daddy chose. But no, yeah, looking at this, um, I think this is, yeah, this is going to, this is going to cut up to a pretty small field. Um, the big, 
joker in the pack here is walking on air for uh, the Nicky Henderson team. Mm. Uh, this horse, wow. I mean, he absolutely vaulted up on his hurdling debut, didn't he, at Newbury? Uh, I mean, he won head in chest, looked an absolute machine. Uh, they were going to send him straight to, to Cheltenham for the Ballymore, uh, it sounded like. And then um, it, it, Nicky Henderson, for whatever reason, he just wasn't quite happy with him. Perhaps thought it might have been a bit too much of a baptism of fire on just his second hurdle start. So kept him fresh for this. Yeah, look, three stripe life brings the best form to the table, but I, I would be shocked if uh, walking on air wasn't on a steep upward curve and uh, a very quick one uh, that is as well. I think yeah, two and a half miles suiting bang on, and yeah, it is um, it's fascinating. I really don't know too much of you. No, but it seems to be a bit of a theme actually with our yeah, Grand National previews because Ed and Stephen are in agreement. Stephen, you're going for walking mm. on air in this one as well. So can you just tell us a little bit more as to why? Well, he was so impressive at Newbury, and I know that connections were on for Cheltenham for the Ballymore, so there must have been a slight setback, I'd have thought, um, before they, he got taken out. But this could be quite a hot race. I mean, I have a feeling three-stripe life might be slightly underpriced and possibly flattered by a literal reading of that form. And there's some hot horses in here. Walking on air could be anything. I've gone for him. Um, Colonel Mustard, who's got solid place form in some strong races. I think Dan Skelton's going to run L.S. Bell, who's a very useful um, mare, who ran a screamer in the bumper at Aintree last year. Um, so that's three. Um, it could be a hot race. I've gone for walking on there very much on potential. Um, I know they were absolutely mortified first time out when he got beaten in a bumper. He pulled too hard that day and bumped into a plot of Gary Moores. But that debut over hurdles at Newbury was so impressive. It stayed firmly in the memory and I think walking on air will be very hard to beat here as long as the ground stays decent. And Danny just to get your view as well on the uh, the, the first grade one we're going to look at here uh, so yeah look at, listening to the guys do you take anything else for that race or yeah, do you kind of it, in agreement? There's not much you can really disagree with there walking on air's potential is huge but the the one I like is Colonel Mustard you know as the, the lads have said already that third in the county hurdle reads very well. I think the step up to two and a half miles here should really suit. And a horse, you know, with a lot of experience, a second season novice, uh, I think, yeah, has a, a good chance of, of being involved here. You know, Tree Stripe Life sets a good standard, but at, at the prices, I think you can't go too far wrong with Colonel Mustard. Lovely stuff. All right, let's move on to the three o'clock, the uh, Maggle Novices Chase. Now here, Edward Stone does look like the worthy favourite. So Danny, just take us through your thoughts on Edward Stone. Should it be the odds on favourite here? And the, what, if anything, can challenge it? I, I, I'm wondering, can anything touch it? Third time lucky, possibly the fact that he's, he's skipped Cheltenham. I'd give him a chance. I don't think he's as good probably needs to you know, sharpen up a little bit more and find that bit more ability. I think gentleman to me at, at two to one to, to beat Edward Stone, the likes of, you know, Blue Blue uh, River to tell Blue Lord in Cheltenham were probably bigger prices to, to beat Edward Stone and gentleman to me, I think would have to improve to beat them. Uh, I, I don't mm. think he deserves to be a shorter price. I'd love to see Edward Stone go and do it again. The only one possibly for, for me to beat him is third time lucky, but I just don't think he has enough ability, even if Edward Stone runs possibly a few pounds below his best uh, for that race in Cheltenham, he'll still win here. Yeah, and Vincent, I know you're on Edward Stone as well. So, I mean, do you share the view of Danny there? I mean, there's not much in terms of challenges, maybe third time lucky? No, I do. I, I think that the Cheltenham performance was, was something really top drawer. I think Edward Stone is in a different league to these. I'd be very disappointed if this horse doesn't win. I know it's a short price, it's four to seven, but just I'm tipping it more to say to people, don't oppose this. This will win, would be my opinion. Uh, gentleman to me is is a very keen, bold front runner. I don't think it's good enough, to be honest with you. I don't think it, it, it's in the same class. And I thought third time, third time lucky was a decent horse early in the season, but I really don't think it's in the same level as Edward Stone at this stage. I'd be very disappointed if Edward Stone doesn't win. And Stephen, putting your bookmaker's hat on as well, like the four to seven, does that really tempt you in any way or is it just maybe too short? I, I don't think it's the time of the year to bet, bet in seven or four on. They've all had long, hard seasons, but there's no doubt he's a clear form choice. The negative for gentlemen to me is if a horse called Four Pleasure runs, who's a bold front runner, they tried holding on to him at Cheltenham and that didn't work on heavy ground, but 
but four pleasure will be ten lengths clear, which will be a big spoiler for Gentledon to me um, if they if they both turn up. So Edward Stone's got a great makeup. He's got third time lucky to beat. I mean, the one thing to say about third time lucky is he is an Aintree horse. He will love Aintree. He's a smooth traveling glider. When he settles, which he should do in a strongly run race, everything's ideal for him today. So he's a worthy opponent. But I have gone for Ed, Edward Stone um, in the in the tips. Yeah, nice one. All right, let's move on to the Liverpool hurdle. Of course, massive race for you, Danny. Potentially Florian Porter going for it as well. So I mean, I mean, we talked before as well about how Florian Porter shaped up after Cheltenham. But just take us through how he has been uh, after the race, after the Stairs hurdle, of course, and how he's shaping up for Aintree. Yeah, he seems in great nick. Gavin is very happy with how he's came out of Cheltenham. And, you know, in Cheltenham, as last year, he behaved very well. And he went back then in Punchestown after that and just boiled over before the race. So everything will be key to keeping him relaxed beforehand. But I think he's possibly a better horse when he travels away from home. The fact that he needs to get to a race course a couple of days before his races when he's running outside of Ireland it gives him a chance to settle in on site uh, where in Ireland he just arrives at the track on the day and you know that that might be a factor in it I think uh, you know that there's probably plenty of others from Cheltenham they'll try their best to change tactics they might not allow me to dictate as much but that doesn't really bother me if they, they want to go and take him on on the front end. I'm sure Ashdale Bob made the run in, in the handicap in Cheltenham. And you know there, there's one other there that, that can jump out and go as well. And if they do, it's not really that much of an inconvenience to me. I think once I'm going a good gallop on floor and Porter, he's the best horse on the day. And it's, uh, it's my job just to keep him chilled beforehand and have a go from there. I think there's an interesting horse in the field here that... Uh, lined up in Cheltenham as well, Kashari. He won a handicap in Aintree earlier in the year. He's an ex-Willie Mullins horse. David Christie has done a fine job with him. He's only beaten seven lengths in the stairs, Hurl and Cheltenham, haven't been off since November. Uh, I think picked up a slight injury and uh, chatting to David Christie after the race uh, in Cheltenham, I, I think he, he believes there's a bit more to come and should the, the pace be a little bit hotter and a lot of the ones that were behind Florin Porter in Cheltenham probably attacked me a little bit earlier. I think there's a, a chance uh, Kashari has a, a good each way bet in the race but I still believe uh, Florin Porter is the best horse and no matter what they throw at me I, I think he's good enough to win. And I mean how much confidence are you going to have after obviously beating Time Hill champ in the stairs going into this race? I mean I mean, it sounds like you're pretty confident, not too bothered about those horses, but how much danger do those horses represent in this race? You know, they, it, it's like going into Cheltenham, you know, they, I I definitely respect them. Uh, I don't fear them. Uh, I think, you know, with all the hype after the Cheltenham race, there's definitely a few people are going to change tactics, but... You know, I, I didn't get to lead in Leopardstown at Christmas and had I got a, a fair start that day, uh, I think that was a, a great run. Uh, not being in front wasn't uh, wasn't the beating of me in Leopardstown and if they take me on more on the front end through the early part of the race in Aintree, uh, it won't really bother me. I, I'll set my own fractions and, you know, uh, hopefully I'm good enough again. Lovely stuff. Well, hopefully, yeah, we do get a winner for you, Danny, there. Um, but I want to bring in Stephen as well, just to take your view on the race. I mean, are you just all in on floor Porter for this, for this one? Uh, no, I, I thought, I mean, Danny gave floor Porter the perfect ride at Cheltenham. They did um, let him go four lengths clear early on on his own, and he got the run of the race and got a breather in before three out and then kicked again. It was a perfect ride. I prefer Champ only because I think Champ might be a bit more of an Aintree horse. And he saw, um, I was on each way um, in the stairs hurdle, Champ, quite heavily. So, obviously, he finished fourth, which was mortifying for me at the mm -hmm. time. But I thought he ran really well. He just saw far too much daylight. He's a strong traveller. He is quirky. When he won at Ascot, he thought about idling and then went again after the last. Um, I'm hoping that John Joe Jr. will cover Champ up. And I'm also hoping... Uh, not from Danny's point of view, obviously, but I hope Florian Porter does get taken on. There are one or two who might. And 
a front runner that everyone knows what he's going to do is quite a dangerous thing. I suspect they'll be much more aware this time around, hopefully. Um, and hopefully, John Joe can produce Champ fast and late after the last. I do think Aintree will suit Champ a lot more than Cheltenham. He's a very smooth traveller with a, a short turn of foot. And I think they used him up the wrong way at Cheltenham. Um, he's around four to one and Florian Porter's seven to four. So for me, I can only go one way at the prices. And Ed, I'll bring you in here as well. I mean, do you echo the thoughts of Stephen there or are you backing Danny to get the win on Florian Porter? Mm. Yeah, I wonder if Canny Danny will have us all uh, playing catch up again in this one. Yeah, that was uh, mm. now a brilliant ride for Danny on the day at Cheltenham. And can Florian Porter do it away from his beloved Cheltenham, I suppose? That's the backing up the race. Uh, will be the big question mark. I mean, time here, I, I cannot have a tool. I think Philip Hobbs has gone three weeks without a winner. He set out 40 horses in that time, including some short price ones that have been turned over. That's got to be a worry. Obviously, uh, to play devil's advocate, he did win this race 12 months ago, but he came there fresh, avoiding Cheltenham. Um, so I'm not sure whether he's had the ideal prep. Look, you know, I'm a very patient man, Joe. I've been sitting here. I've been keeping my mouth shut. I've been saying Thomas Darby, he's got to have a crack at this, a big staying race all season. Uh, Ollie Murphy sends him to the Rendlesham and ground like treacle. He pulls up and then comes out after and says he wished he'd never done it and kept him bubble wrap for the stairs hurdle. And of course, I'm uh, wincing into my Betfair balance as, as, as that kind of comment comes out. But look, Thomas Darby was third in this last year, was ridden cold, and wasn't far off them at all. I think we'll see similar tactics again here. I think there could be a lot of pace on. He'll be ridden patiently. He'll creep into it. Let's not forget, people seem to have very short memories about him. He absolutely wiped the floor with Paisley Park on good ground at Newbury uh, earlier on in the season. There's not going to be no heavy in the going description here. He's going to get some really nice ground to attack. And I think from an each-way perspective, I think still a bit of 14-1 to 1 floating around. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if, as I said, he was he was ridden cold, held up, racing the ambulance, turning into the home straight, and let everyone else kind of have this battle up tops and swoop late. And uh, yeah, if he runs into a place or even better, uh, I'm more than happy. Great stuff. Uh, Vincent, now you've sat there kind of taking in the views of all the guys on this race, but let's have your view going on to the Liverpool hurdle. Yeah, I, th I think Daniel win. I think Daniel win and Florian Porter. Uh, the, as, as Danny said himself, Ashdale Bob is the most likely one to, to uh, mess around with the pace. I don't think um, that's a contender uh, to win the race. The other one that Danny mentioned um, is that Kashari, the gas thing is he hadn't run before Cheltenham since November 2021. And um, that, that day caused an 80 to 1 shock at entry over a similar course and distance. So it'd be interesting to see how that runs. It certainly might be one at a very big price, maybe for the forecast, but I think Danny will win. I, I don't think there's that much danger from some of the horses that finished behind him in Cheltenham. I thought he had them well stuffed. And um, this this race is, I think it's nearly an extra furlong as well compared to the Cheltenham race. I know it's on the level rather than up a hill, but if you if you look at the Cheltenham race, you stop it at the line and say, what's going to happen in another furlong? I think Danny wins even further is the bottom line. Yeah, I mean, well, I was back in Florian Porter as well at Cheltenham, so I'll be backing you again, Danny. So, yeah, thanks for that winner in the Cheltenham Festival. And right, now we're going to move on to the big race of the day. Of course, the whole festival is geared up to the Grand National, so at 5.15. So, as Danny touched on, that, that hour break between the races, I mean, how do you deal with that as a jockey? I mean, what do you do? I mean, do you just kind of twiddle your thumbs a bit, or what, what are you doing? <laughs> well, I suppose you, you have all your homework done at that stage, yeah. and... For me, it's maybe a case of putting in the earphones, listening to Spotify or watching something on Netflix and chill out and just have a quick <laughs> flick at the farm again and get ready to roll. <laughs> Lovely stuff. And uh, looking at this year's renewal, of course. <laughs> <laughs> looking at this year's renewal, Danny, I mean, is there a particular horse that if you were to have your own pick, I mean, which one really take, or stands out for you at this point? I think Snow Leopardess, you know, she's a very deserving favourite here. Loved the fences in the Beecher chase uh, and was very tough, you know, probably extra distance with the ground possibly being a bit nicer than it was that day. I have to give her a big chance. Any second now, obviously loved the fences last year, but only had 10-9 last year. Carries 11-7 this year. It's a fair, fair ask. Uh, I think... Uh, a big chance I'd have to give to would be Noble Yates. He's been trained for this race all year. You know, Emmett uh, has you know plotted and planned with him. Actually, one of the qualifications was that I think he needs six runs over fences prior to the race. So uh, 
before the entry is Emmett was quite keen to get a, a few runs into him and that probably told on his form maybe flattening out the odd day but uh, he's been trained since Cheltenham for this probably disappointed in Cheltenham but I, I don't think Cheltenham suited him that handicap experience will stand to him and with 10-9 on I'd have to give him a, a big chance in it Lovely. All right, well, let's move on to Ed. I want to get your kind of experience of punting on the Grand National. I mean, take us through some of your history. How successful have you been in the race? Oh, proper mixed bag, to be honest with you, Joe. Uh, I think Neptune Colonge, my last uh, my last winner, uh, or party politics, probably my first, and um, something like Clan Royale, probably the big heartbreak in between. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's a great race. It's great fun. It's not a race, to be blunt, I take the most seriously from a betting perspective, because I think you can just tie your head in knots, uh, to be honest with you. There's so much in the day luck that can be brought mm. into it. You know, a horse carries you out at the wrong time. Yeah. And a timely horse falls in front of you. Uh, as Danny said, you know, it can be absolute carnage. You've mm. got 10, 15 horses almost boxed in around each other. You can have a bit of a domino effect if something goes wrong. So yeah, to get caught up on weights and measures and left-handed and right-handed, I, I take it all with a little bit of a pinch of salt. I think it's a lovely spectacle. I love watching it. Uh, I mean, for, for what it's worth so far, I mean, Fiddler on the Roof and Kildersart, the two I've backed anti-post. Uh, I, I see the Tizar team, as we said, they're in good form. It's been kept fresh for this since finishing runner-up at Ascot. Uh, I go back to his uh, Newbury run in the Labricks Trophy. Uh, they, you know, the front two pulled a long way clear in the third that day. To me, he just looked like he just would gallop on forever. He's just become beautifully slow, I think, really. He's unexposed. You could argue perhaps he's a little bit young to win a Grand National, but uh, I think he'll get the trip. And, and Kildesart is another horse. He's got some very good entry form. It's on the comeback after injury and could go well at a price. But, um, yeah, of the real protagonists, is tricky. You've got to respect Dow to work. I'd probably like to see a lot of rain for him, uh, it has to be said. Uh, they have, incidentally, put a lot of water on the national course, it's worth mm. pointing out. Um, in the build-up to, to entry. So I do think the ground, whatever the rain does uh, between now and Saturday, will be riding uh, a bit slower than the rest of the track, shall we say. And another one, if the ground did turn soft, would be Longhouse Poet, who's on my kind of rain radar. You know, mm. jumped and travelled beautifully when he won the Taistis um, earlier on in the season uh, and had a little prep run in the Boyne Hurdle since. So all in all, I'm still kind of putting the pieces of the jigsaw together, which we'll, we'll try and unveil uh, on our show uh, later on in the week. But uh, for now, yeah, it's just a race I really do enjoy. And uh, yeah, one that always uh, is, is captivating to the audience, shall we say. And Stephen, yeah, from bettingexpert.com, of course, can you give us some advice as to the best approach for punters going into the Grand National? I mean, yeah, take it away. Well, uh, the first advice, Joe, is to turn your phone off for the day because you find all the relatives you never knew you had start <laughs> ringing you to contact you. So I've always got a pre-prepared paragraph to text to people, send to everyone on WhatsApp, and it saves you hours on the phone and then lots of recriminations afterwards. You can just mute them all. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, my first winner for the National, I think, was uh, Corbiere in 1983, which shows how old I am. Obviously, I was just a very young lad then. Um, but Mr. Frisk, I remember really well in 1990. Mm -hmm. That was on firm ground, proper big fences in those days. Of course, Danny's very lucky these days. It's like a Worcester brush hurdle race now, isn't it? <laughs> they just fly around like the clappers. There's 32 finishes and eight of them get tired. Um, no fall, there's no carnage. Let, let's hope that happens again this year. Um, I think there's one who's a very big price. Um, Run Wild Fred is 12 to 1. Davy Russell booked. Gordon Elliott has been a bit quiet, but Run Wild Fred is completely unexposed, um, granted a, an extreme test of stamina. He's run twice um, over three mile five, three mile six. Last time in the Kim Muir, it was a funny race. The ground had dried out. It was really quick, I thought, really for him. He just got swamped for pace. I wouldn't hold that against him. Previously, he'd run a blinder in the Irish Grand National. He's a sound jumper. Good to soft ground would be ideal. Davy Russell will smuggle him round. Obviously, Davy's won it twice on Tiger Roll. He knows how to ride Aintree. Hopefully, he'll get some luck in running. 25 to 1. And what we always say, Joe, look for bookmakers. Extra places. There's certainly six places about very easily. But on the day, it could be eight or even more. So, hunt around. But uh, run wild, Fred, for me. Yeah, and Vincent, I know you've actually liked the chances of Run Wild Fred previously. You picked him up on Jump To It. So, over to you. And um, I wanted to ask, actually, about the impact that Rachel's win had just in for the sport in general after she won the grand national 
Oh, I think it's it's well, it's taken Rachel particularly to a completely different level, hasn't it? She's she's gone global because of it. Um, she's a fantastic ambassador for the sport, and I think it's wonderful for the sport that she did win it. Uh, particularly her, rather than I, I know we we talk about you know all women doing this and women doing that, but my God, she is such an ambassador for for females within sport, females in Ireland, and just for Irish people in general. I think she's fantastic, and I think it's wonderful. Obviously, she's got a chance again here with Manila Times. I I thought last year. Uh, I thought the horse was a very short price on the day, considering, um, but I presume it was the Rachel factor, and that could be the case again here. We could well see money for that come the day. Uh, hard to see it win, but should definitely be a contender again, I would have thought. Um, there's lots of them here I like. Any second now has a definite chance. Run while Fred, I know I've been with it in the past. I'd be, I'd be against it here. Uh, I think it, this is more of an afterthought after Cheltenham. Personally, I think there's other Gordon Elliott horses I prefer. One of them is Farkla. It was fifth in the race last year as a seven-year-old. No seven-year-old has won this in my living memory. I don't know when the last seven-year-old was, certainly not in the last 20-odd years anyway. Um, and it's only had two runs since last year, and one of them was uh, the last run was in November in the Troy Town Chase when it did chase home, run wild Fred, but I thought that's a good run. Um, Farclad definitely has a squeak at a big price. Um, other, other ones in here, Escartia 10, of course, has form at any second now. And then the one I really like is Longhouse Poet, Martin Brazzles. He's won this race before with number six, Valverde. Um, I think that he's a solid trainer. He's got a solid horse here. They landed a bit of a punt on it in the Tiestes in January in Gorn Park. And uh, that looks like a very good run. There were some good horses in that race, lots of good horses around there. And I, I'd be expecting a big run from this. He's a very shrewd trainer. Lovely stuff. Now, Danny, I know we don't have you booked yet or 100% confirmed for a ride, but if you are going to be riding in the Grand National, best of luck to you. And uh, also, yeah, thank you very much for joining us here on irishracing.com. Uh, we'll, we'll leave you now. Best of luck and I uh, hope you go well. Uh, but now we're going to move on to our tips of the day for day three. Stephen, I think you've covered some of yours already, but let's just have your picks for day three of the Entry Festival. My three tips on the day, starting off in the 225 of Walk Your On Air, who's around four to one, I think open to loads of improvement or love decent ground, hopefully will settle and, and should go close. In the 335, I'm going to stick with Champ, although he let us down at uh, Cheltenham. I think he's a fair price at four to one. And in the Grand National at 515, run wild Fred, who I think is 25 to one in places. I think he's bound to run well with a clean round of jumping. Great stuff. And uh, Ed, over to you for your picks for day three, please. Yeah, walking on air, uh, on balance to take on three stripe life. Uh, the big unknown quantity walking on air. We're going to go with him. He's exciting. Uh, Thomas Darby each way at 14s in the Liverpool hurdle. I think he can run into a place. And then Sham Blue in the race an hour before the Grand National. Flat track, decent ground, three miles, off 148 in the handicap. Surely four to one. I cannot boot this horse out of the frame. If there's no carnage or Tom Fulgery doesn't end up on the deck. I think he could uh, laugh at this lot. You know, he was three fences clear um, mm. when he fell in the Charlie Hall. He's better than 148. Uh, I was shocked they went for the Ryanair with him personally. This is his bag. So, yeah, Shamblu in the 415. And I'll be trying to whittle down my short list of about 23 runners down to three or four for the Grand National Show, Joe. So that's going to be my project in the meantime. Great stuff, Ed. Well, thanks a lot for your tips and uh, best of luck to you, of course. Like Ed says, we will be back on Friday with a more in-depth preview of the Grand National when we have the runners. But Vincent, over to you for your day three tips, please. Yeah, um, the best bets for me are Edward Stone in the three o'clock. I'm pretty sure it'll win. It's a short price, maybe not to one to put as a single bet, but certainly maybe if you're going to do doubles and trebles, I'd be including that. Uh, the other one is Flooring Porter, which I'd definitely be including in doubles and trebles as well. I think Danny will win that race again on Flooring Porter. And then in the Grand National itself, I think an each-way bet on Longhouse Poet for me at around odds of 20 to 1 is definitely worth an interest. And just one other horse to mention, if it turns up in the first race, we haven't got declared runners at this stage, but if it does run in the first, Langer Dan was very unlucky in Cheltenham when it was brought down. Uh, they've gone for a punt in that race in Cheltenham the last two years. They, they deserve a bit of a change of luck. And if Langer Dan turns up, I'd be expecting that to be a major contender in the first. I know my dad was punted on him, so hopefully we'll get some retribution for <laughs> Langer Dan. Uh, but that wraps it up for our day three preview. Thanks a lot to Danny Mullins, Ed Quigley, Stephen Harris, and Vincent Finnegan once again on irishracing.com. Now, of course, if you do place a bet on any of our selections, please do gamble responsibly. And we'll be back very soon with more content here on Irish Racing. <laughs>